Hello. Now we begin a unit called America in Crisis, which you see before you. I've combined the civil rights movement in the Vietnam War into one unit, uh, which is sometimes done, though our textbook does not do it that way. Uh, so we're going to deal with uh, one crisis uh, after the other uh, in order. Uh, you can see from the screen that uh, during this period, uh, mostly the 1960s, but going back uh, into the 50s somewhat as well, uh, America was in crisis in numerous ways, uh, lots of turmoil domestically, uh, uh, to be certain. So we're going to start with the Civil Rights Movement, and I like to always begin with a quote from Frederick Douglass, uh, the African-American abolitionist, uh, an escaped slave, an eloquent uh, writer and speaker uh, uh, for the anti-slavery movement before the Civil War, and a civil rights uh, activist uh, and writer uh, after the Civil War as well. He said, those who profess to favor freedom uh, and yet depreciate agitation uh, are men who want crops without plowing up the ground. They want rain without thunder and lightning, uh, without thunder and lightning. They want the ocean without the awful roar of its many waters. Power concedes nothing without demand. It never did and it never will. Uh, the main uh, uh, thing to focus on here is just that last sentence. Uh, power concedes nothing without demand. Yeah, he's saying, of course, that power, uh, people in power, institutions of power, like government, generally just doesn't hand you something uh, uh, to be kind. Sometimes you have to go out and sort of snatch it, demand it, grab it, uh, and agitate for it. Uh, and he understood this uh, well before the civil rights movement, uh, as uh, many have learned uh, throughout the ages uh, through hard experience. As far as the significance of the civil rights movement is concerned, I'm not going to read this verbatim for you. You can do that on your own, of course. But there's uh, two ways in which we see uh, the significance here. The, the most obvious and important way is that this was the beginning uh, of a long-term struggle uh, for civil rights, for basic equality, uh, for an end to discrimination, and into segregation. Uh, and an end to racism, which we know is still going on today. Uh, but uh, this is the beginnings uh, of the big push in that direction. That's not to say that African Americans had been doing nothing before uh, this uh, in that direction. Uh, but this is, uh, and we'll get to that in a second, but this is the main, uh, uh, the beginnings uh, of a large-scale concerted mass movement, the civil rights movement, uh, in that direction. So any progress that's been made in race relations, not just uh, in terms of African Americans' rights, uh, but any uh, minority group's rights, uh, in a sense, began here uh, with this movement in the 1950s, which leads us to the second way in which this is significant, uh, and that is the civil rights movement became the model for all of the other mass movements uh, of the era, uh, mainly the, again, uh, late 50s uh, through the 1960s. So the anti-Vietnam War movement itself, many of the anti-Vietnam War activists, college students, uh, uh, many of them, some of whom became famous, first cut their teeth as uh, political activists in the South in the 1950s before the Vietnam War, working uh, for uh, working uh, for the civil rights movement in one capacity or another. But the feminist movement, the American Indian movement, uh, the farm workers movement, the gay rights movement, uh, which is what it was called at the time, all of those things and more uh, really looked to the civil rights movement as a model for how to organize uh, and how to uh, undertake uh, and carry out a mass movement. As far as the origins of the civil rights movement uh, go, and here's where we can see that African Americans were not sitting still uh, and doing nothing until the civil rights movement came along in the middle of the 1950s and you know, came out of nowhere. Uh, this is just not true. We could go all the way back, and I will momentarily, to Reconstruction, uh, the amendments passed uh, by the U.S. government uh, and ratified by the states, 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, ending slavery, uh, citizenship rights for African Americans, and voting rights for African Americans. We know that the latter two of those amendments, after Reconstruction ended, uh, lie dormant for a long period of time, but they're resuscitated uh, here. So they were still there on the books, waiting to be used, uh, and indeed they were. So even that, uh, as short-lived as Reconstruction was, those amendments uh, did prove to be important later on, uh, and they are still important in some ways today. 
around the turn of the 20th century, this is something we didn't talk about earlier in class, but a number of African American organizations formed of great importance. The NAACP, which is still around today, formed in 1909. The Niagara Movement uh, in 1905. Uh, um, both of them uh, had uh, W.E.B. Du Bois as one of their uh, early leaders and creators, but there were other prominent African American leaders uh, involved. Uh, through the early decades of the 20th century, we see the development of a rather robust African American middle class. And this is important because uh, not only did it show that African Americans could, uh, you know, uh, overcome obstacles uh, in certain cases uh, and achieve success within American society, uh, but the, this middle class uh, tended to be the leadership of the civil rights movement. We get there uh, in the rest of this unit, uh, just as the best example I can give you, the most famous one, Martin Luther King Jr. was a pastor, a Protestant minister by trade, uh, which is a middle class profession. And many of his uh, associates, colleagues uh, in, in the movement, other leaders were uh, pastors as well. The uh, civil rights uh, leaders before the movement began uh, throughout the 20th century had been uh, engaging in a long-term series of legal actions to try to uh, win rights uh, for African Americans uh, in discrimination in things like uh, uh, applications to college uh, and so forth uh, by using the court system. Uh, and uh, there was a long-term legal strategy uh, put forth by black attorneys and white uh, attorneys uh, that were working in concert together. So this uh, t tends to go unseen today or, or not talked about today, uh, but this uh, is already a good example uh, of African Americans taking matters into their own hands. So again, to repeat, all of these things are examples of African Americans, uh, in a sense, building up uh, uh, opposition uh, to segregation and discrimination uh, so that we don't uh, we don't continue with a, any kind of misapprehension that the civil rights movement came out of nowhere. We did in class talk about, however briefly, the Harlem Renaissance of the 1920s and saw there that though this was a an explosion of African-American creativity in the arts, uh, writing, uh, music, etc., that it wasn't just art for uh, art's own sake, that was true too, but plenty of it had a political uh, uh, content, political overtones or undertones, uh, whichever one those you like, over or under. But uh, I, I mentioned in class, I believe, Langston Hughes' famous poem, uh, 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 Or Does It Explode? Couldn't think of it there for a minute. Uh, but uh, so the Harlem Renaissance uh, showed kind of took the temperature of race relations in American society in the 1920s uh, and shows a, a building amount of frustration on the part of African Americans uh, through, in this case, literature and art. Not that there weren't other ways that, that could be expressed and seen as well. The advent of television also uh, is a, a component of the origins of the movement. We'll, we'll see how television affected the movement itself uh, once the civil rights movement proper begins. Uh, but here, uh, I, I'm noting that even before the movement, uh, the the uh, arrival of television in American homes by the millions uh, throughout the decade of the 1950s uh, produced, uh, I think, uh, a growing understanding, if there wasn't one before, there was to some degree, uh, an increasing understanding, I guess, by African Americans of how much of American society they were being sort of left out of. There weren't too many television shows uh, with African-American characters, let alone whole TV shows uh, about African-American families uh, or whatever it might be. Uh, so uh, this, uh, I think, also led to frustration uh, and a feeling uh, that this is uh, unacceptable. During the Great Depression, I don't know that I mentioned this in class, uh, but uh, there was lots of uh, political activism by African-Americans in places like New York City, uh, other big cities, uh, sometimes uh, about race, sometimes they overlapped with other economic issues of the Depression. Uh, there was a series of uh, meat uh, uh, boycotts uh, in New York City in the middle of the 1930s, right in the midst, uh, middle of the Great Depression, uh, where uh, not just African Americans, but New Yorkers boycotted uh, meat 
uh, grocery stores, butcher shops. Uh, I'm saying the prices, uh, you know, were unfairly gouging them. And this uh, uh, also led to uh, coexisted alongside of uh, protests, sometimes at the same stores, uh, because uh, some of these uh, places refuse to hire, uh, refuse to serve uh, African Americans. So there's already uh, some, uh, you know, vibrant protests going on in certain places during the Great Depression of the type, uh, though much smaller number, that we will see uh, later in this unit uh, in the 1950s and beyond. And lastly, World War II and the Korean War, I think, are uh, clearly uh, important uh, causes, uh, at least short, in the short term, uh, of the civil rights movement. Both wars saw African Americans serving with distinction in the first, uh, in World War II, the first of these two. The, it's certainly true that African Americans were discriminated against in the military, among other things, and most obviously, they were segregated into separate units. African Americans fought usually under the leadership of white officers, but they were uh, completely African American units otherwise. And there was plenty of racism here, uh, as you might expect. African Americans uh, got sent to do uh, some of the most, uh, you know, uh, uh, some of the jobs that were least, uh, uh, you know, uh, palatable, I guess is the word to say, that used. So, uh, for instance, uh, there was a big explosion on the West Coast, uh, coast of California, at an uh, armaments uh, facility, uh, stockpiled weapons and ammunition, and there was an accident, but, at least as far as we know, but two-thirds of the soldiers killed uh, in that accidental explosion were African Americans, uh, for the reason that, as you may have guessed, that uh, it wasn't a job that anyone really wanted to do. And so, because of discrimination and racism, African Americans were disproportionately assigned uh, to do that kind of work. That's just one example. On ships across the ocean to Europe, uh, you know, soldiers going to war, African American units were often forced to uh, eat after white troops uh, ate. White units would eat first, they go in later. They'd oftentimes have the least uh, uh, comfortable accommodations. They're uh, bunks and barracks uh, near the engine room where it's loud and hot and noisy. So there are all kinds of ways in which African Americans were discriminated against in World War II uh, through discrimination uh, uh, or uh, you know, was discrimination. In the Korean War, uh, to the credit of President Truman uh, after uh, the Second World War, in 1948, he desegregated the military for the first time. Uh, and so in that latter war, Blacks and whites uh, uh, fought alongside each other, uh, you know, for the entire war. Either way, uh, in both wars, I think the salient point here is that African Americans came home uh, from these wars uh, with, I, I think, a greater uh, uh, sense of their own rights, uh, a a, uh, a greater sense that, hey, wait a minute, I I I'm a patriotic American citizen, and I am an American citizen. I just fought for my country. Uh, I just risk my life for my country, uh, and I come back here, and I'm still a second-class citizen in my hometown or home city. That's uh, you know more unacceptable than it ever has been. So, in a sense, the two world wars—not just the experience of the soldiers, but their own families—were uh, uh, kind of a breaking point of sorts. I had a professor when I was in college that said it's no coincidence. He believed that the Korean War ended just before the civil rights movement began. It could be coincidence, but I think there's likely to be something to it. As far as the civil rights uh, movement and popular memory is concerned, which you see before you, uh, this uh, is to say that popular memory has been uh, something that historians have studied a great deal and written about a lot recently. Uh, in numerous books on different subjects, not just the civil rights movement, but any uh, subject in history. Uh, but it deals with, among other things, how what we remember about wars and movements and various aspects of history uh, through uh, popular culture, through television, the movies, advertising, whatever else it may be, can sometimes uh, go astray from the actual historical record which I don't think surprises anyone in this class. But nonetheless, uh, with regard to the civil rights movement itself, uh, we can see this in numerous ways. 
Again, I'm not going to read the, the quotes here, but uh, you, uh, of course, may. So one example of this uh, is the way that Martin Luther King and Malcolm X are portrayed uh, in, in media, uh, in popular culture. They're seen as polar opposites of each other. One, Martin Luther King, famously uh, preached nonviolence uh, and the civil rights movement uh, when it was largely under his leadership, not officially but unofficially, uh, did uh, practice nonviolence. And Malcolm X coming along uh, and saying, sometimes violence actually may be necessary. Uh, and so uh, they're painted as a dichotomy, a real contrast in styles, which was somewhat true. But it can be overstated and over, I think, uh, emphasized. For instance, Malcolm X wasn't talking about just indiscriminate violence. He was, in a sense, saying, if white people are going to come into black communities and shoot at us and harm us, we're going to defend ourselves the same way. If they shoot at us uh, and shoot at my family, my kids, I'm going to shoot back at them, which I think uh, most Americans uh, you know, today w would you know, nod their heads uh, and, and say, yeah, they had the right to do that. And, you know, any family, uh, uh, you know, uh, would. So this makes it look, I think, a little bit different than the the dichotomy that's often uh, painted between the two. And in fact, both leaders uh, started to uh, move closer together, uh, not uh, in, in terms of their personal relations. I think they were somewhat uh, distant from each other, not necessarily out of animosity, uh, but uh, in their views, uh, they both uh, just happened to come uh, to uh, similar conclusions uh, about uh, society. Both of them, for instance, began to embrace socialism late in their lives, in their careers, both assassinated uh, in different years. But uh, towards the end of their lives, they both were seeing or believing anyway that capitalism was a major factor, uh, a major part of racism uh, in the U.S., uh, they also believed that uh, American foreign policy, particularly Dr. King, uh, also uh, sort of connected to, to racism as, as well. It's also possible that they may have coordinated to some degree. I said they didn't you know, uh, spend that much time together, uh, and I don't think they did, but they may have coordinated something together, at least in a tacit agreement. Even if they didn't, it, it worked out the following way. Martin Luther King... I think commanded more respect from the white uh, uh, community, the you know, majority white society, uh, partly because uh, Malcolm X was seen as uh, more frightening uh, to whites, racists uh, and you know non-racist alike. Faced with the two alternatives, the majority of white people are saying, "We'll take Martin Luther King." If it had just been Martin Luther King in the picture, I don't mean this picture, but you know Malcolm X wasn't around. Period. Uh, King may have been more objectionable uh, than he is uh, with uh, the other uh, alternative being Malcolm X. So if Americans uh, only had one civil rights leader uh, as their option, Martin Luther King, they may have been uh, more, uh, uh, there may have been more animosity towards him. Not that there wasn't some, there was plenty, but there were certainly more uh, for Malcolm X. And I should say to be responsible here, there are certain things that Malcolm X did and said that I think are indefensible. For instance, he said at one point, uh, all white people are devils, uh, which I just don't think can be defended uh, in, uh, in any possible way. So uh, media criticism of him uh, certainly uh, can be attributed to racism correctly uh, much of the time. But he did say certain things uh, that uh, were uh, you know, uh, unacceptable, uh, you know, period. So similarities between the two, we already uh, talked about them both moving in the direction of uh, critic, a, a greater critique of a capitalist system uh, and it started to embrace uh, more and more socialist principles, at least get interested in them. So this is saying that they both became more radicalized uh, over time. There are other examples, by the way, uh, of how popular memory can distort the civil rights movement, one of which is there tends to be uh, a focus on Martin Luther King himself, and I'm about to do that myself, so uh, I don't want to be a hypocrite here, but before we get into this, there is no doubt that Martin Luther King uh, is the dominant leader and an incredibly important part of this movement. 
but he didn't do it by himself. Uh, this was a mass movement. In the picture on the right, you see a church filled with uh, uh, civil rights uh, activists uh, and people, uh, at least in support of the movement. So without the sacrifices of thousands uh, of people uh, and over a, a long period of time, this movement uh, wouldn't have gained any ground at all. So it's not just about Martin Luther King uh, or Malcolm X. Uh, in fact, there are even regional leaders, we'll meet uh, one of them here, who oftentimes, even today, don't get, I think, their due because, and didn't then, because Dr. King sort of took uh, uh, stole everybody's thunder. Not intentionally, but if a local regional organizer, say in Mississippi, uh, puts on some sort of event and Martin Luther King, you know, flies in for one day uh, to you know, put show his face because he is the face of the movement. He was the most famous, uh, the most powerful of all civil rights leaders. So anybody uh, putting on such an event would want him there uh, and want the cameras to see him there. Nonetheless, when he did show up, the, of course, the network, uh, uh, you know, TV uh, uh, news, the uh, all the reporters, the journalists would be, you know, they'd flock to him. So it would leave the regional guy that organized it, brought Martin Luther King in, sort of invisible, uh, at least to the larger public, uh, to the news, uh, to the media. So in this sense, I think we sometimes get a false impression. I could be wrong about this. I'm not saying it's true of everyone, but sometimes I feel that students, uh, when all they learn about the civil rights movement, if asked, well, what's the civil rights movement? Well, it was Martin Luther King doing a lot of stuff for equality. And that's uh, maybe all they could say. And I, I couldn't, I can't blame them entirely because that is kind of what we get on Martin Luther King Day, for instance. We talk about King, as we should, uh, but the holiday... Uh, and uh, they, uh, they always play a snippet of the I Have a Dream speech, his most famous speech, which we'll get to. But it does tend to, I'm not saying there shouldn't be a holiday. There should. Dr. King is one of the most significant political figures uh, in a positive way in our history, uh, in my opinion. Uh, but the, So the holiday uh, is, I think, a good thing. But it does have one, I think, negative uh, 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 repercussion, and that is that it tends to focus uh, attention just on him and move attention away from the many other activists and other leaders uh, who probably deserve uh, more credit than they often get. But it is true that he is the most important leader uh, that we'll uh, uh, deal with uh, in this unit by far, even more so than Malcolm X, though the latter uh, certainly has uh, 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 importance and significance as well. So I say on the screen here, the movement in the spirit of Martin Luther King. What that is uh, supposed to mean is that the way the movement was done, uh, the tactics, the strategy, even the uh, the kind of feeling of the movement, uh, 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 the, the, the texture of the movement had uh, really stemmed from Martin Luther King's leadership. So we'll see in the very first event of the movement uh, itself. From that point forward, uh, with Martin Luther King being sort of catapulted into the leadership role, not necessarily uh, uh, of his own doing, and then becoming uh, sort of the uh, you know most prominent figure and the most prominent face of the civil rights movement, that uh, from, from that point forward, we see the movement uh, taking on uh, sort of uh, uh, qualities that he uh, put forward. For instance, uh, it's sort of nonviolent temper. Uh, uh, that certainly came from Dr. King and some other leaders too, but uh, it was uh, more his influence than anything else. The religious uh, uh, tone of the movement, which you can see in the photograph here, many of the uh, important meetings uh, of the civil rights movement took place in churches. Again, Dr. King was uh, a Protestant minister, as were many of the other leaders, uh, and so uh, it was a natural place to hold civil rights, uh, political activist meetings. But these meetings were usually not just political meetings, they were also church services at the same time. So the, the movement did have a religious uh, tone uh, to it, religious texture to it, no doubt about it. And it it, I think it did add something uh, significant uh, to the movement in a positive way because it gave the the uh, people, the movement, uh, a sense of greater, I think, solidarity uh, because uh, it was rooted in uh, Christianity.
uh, not that it couldn't have been some other religion if you know uh, if it was uh, something else but the f fact that it it did focus on religious principles and uh, certain uh, morals uh, that everybody you know in the these churches or almost everybody uh, adhered to uh, uh, gave it uh, a, an extra kind of moral shot in the arm that uh, the, these uh, the, the rights that African American uh, activists uh, and citizens are fighting for uh, come from uh, deep-seated uh, and very, uh, you know, ancient moral principles going all the way back to Jesus uh, and the uh, uh, New Testament as well as the Old. Before we get to the first event of the Civil Rights Movement, at least a protest sort of event, uh, a blockbuster Supreme Court case happened in 1954 which could be seen, I guess, as the start of the movement. But by movement, we really mean masses of people uh, being involved in protests, demonstrations, marches, etc. So this is one court case, uh, Brown v. Board of Education, 1954. And this uh, struck down the separate but equal doctrine, as you see here, that we talked about early in the class uh, that came, stemmed from the 1896 Plessy v. Ferguson decision, uh, which established not just the phrase and principle separate but equal, but what that meant in reality was that uh, public facilities in the South uh, were, from that point forward, uh, uh, segregated so that schools, restaurants, drinking fountains, bathrooms, railway cars, etc., etc., had white sections uh, and uh, black sections, and it was illegal uh, in southern states for African Americans to sit, uh, say, in the wrong section of a train car. Eventually, as we'll see in the next slide, uh, in the wrong section uh, of a bus, African Americans were forced to sit at the back of buses. So Brown v. Board of Education didn't erase all of this in one stroke, but it was the first case uh, that though it dealt with education specifically and segregated schools, uh, it uh, uh, more generally uh, uh, started the ball rolling towards uh, efforts to desegregate all public facilities. The case came about when African American families uh, in many different states, uh, South Carolina, Kansas, uh, District of Columbia, which is a state but close enough, and some others, uh, began to file lawsuits in their region, their locale, their city, uh, saying, claiming that the uh, separate but equal doctrine and segregation of schools was unconstitutional. And they went to court, and uh, oftentimes at great risk, because uh, as you can imagine, in say Topeka, Kansas, one of the most famous uh, uh, original uh, places where these cases began, this wasn't greeted well by much of the uh, white community. So African-American parents uh, of children forced to go to schools, sometimes you know, far across town when there was a school right next door to them, uh, which was you know, uh, a lot of extra work and hardship that they uh, shouldn't have had to suffer since they're citizens. Uh, but the nearest uh, African-American school was five miles away, uh, and they were prohibited from going to the school across the street because it was an all-white school. So it was this kind of uh, uh, imposition, this kind of injustice that led family after family in state after state to file lawsuits. Uh, but again, they did so with uh, uh, risk involved, uh, threatening phone calls, crosses burned on lawns, uh, and, and you know, th this kind of uh, frightening uh, response by you know, usually anonymous uh, people in the white community. So it took a great deal of courage uh, and uh, a sacrifice on the part of these families and their children uh, to uh, do this at all, which sometimes gets lost uh, in talking about this whole case because of the famous people you see on the screen before you. Uh, so I'd like to start uh, with that. The cases, this case wouldn't have happened at all if it weren't for those families uh, filing suit uh, in local uh, regional areas and the court system or the cases then moving up the ladder on appeal. Uh, the lead attorney uh, in uh, the case, Brown v. Board of Education, uh, is Thurgood Marshall, who you see on the screen. The lead attorney for what was known as the Civil Defense Fund by this time, uh, a part of the NAACP. Uh, he had a talented team of lawyers that worked with him. He was the lead attorney 
He had been an up-and-coming black attorney for quite some time, and this isn't the only case that he argued before the Supreme Court, but it's the most famous and the most influential one uh, ever. Uh, he, by the way, became so famous uh, through this and was such a well-respected uh, attorney that he became later on uh, uh, in life the first African-American uh, appointed to the Supreme Court of the United States. So he's not on the Supreme Court here. He's arguing a case as an attorney before the Supreme Court. And uh, the case was one of the first, might have been the first, uh, of all, uh, was one of the first for a new Chief Justice of the United States, Earl Warren. Uh, uh, he wasn't just a, a new Chief Justice. He was a new Justice, period. Uh, but given the uh, uh, Chief position, because it had been vacant before, uh, sometimes they move somebody up uh, uh, that had been an associate justice before, uh, but didn't happen in this case. And Earl Warren uh, hadn't been a judge at a lower level, which is usually, uh, though it's not you know, certain, it doesn't have to happen that way, usually uh, a lower court judge appeals, uh, circuit courts of appeals uh, somewhere there. But Warren had been a politician, uh, former governor of California, so uh, a pretty high-ranking politician, uh, who is now Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and he has this gigantic case fall on his lap. Uh, you see the other justices uh, there uh, on the court, and after hearing uh, arguments, in fact, Warren uh, and the other justices called the attorneys for both sides. Uh, there, there were attorneys uh, defending uh, segregated facilities, uh, uh, so they were. You know, there was def uh, defense of segregation, as awful as that is, uh, but they called uh, both uh, sides back, plaintiffs uh, and defense attorneys, to do a second round of arguments uh, because they were unsatisfied uh, with uh, you know, what they had to start with. So they were trying to be uh, uh, basically thorough about this. One of the most famous uh, pieces of evidence or types of evidence uh, admitted here uh, was the prosecution uh, the plaintiff's lawyers bringing psychologists forth who had interviewed a lot of little uh, black children uh, of different ages, uh, uh, boy and girl, and did uh, most famously uh, interviews with them where they held up dolls. Uh, some There'd usually be like four dolls, a, a, a white male doll, a white female doll, a black male doll, a black female doll, and the little kids were asked questions like, well, which doll looks like the nice doll? Which doll looks like the, you know, the mean, uh, uh, cruel doll? And and way uh, more than should have happened, uh, black children were pointing at the, you know, black dolls as the sort of more mean or cruel doll, uh, et cetera, et cetera. The point that was trying to be made, and it's arguable, of course, whether this, uh, you know, the, the conclusion is warranted, but it's arguable that it is, of course, well, is that segregation uh, was having a negative uh, impact on the psyches of young children that Earl Warren, uh, in the final decision of the Supreme Court, said uh, might never be undone. Uh, so the uh, the point was that uh, maybe a, life, a lifetime of uh, psychological damage uh, was being done by uh, black children having to go to separate schools. Since they did realize, at least in time, uh, as they got to a certain age, that the reason that they're being forced to go to separate schools and kept apart from white children uh, is that uh, the white community doesn't want to have anything to do with them, uh, thinks of them as inferior, uh, and has sort of cordoned them off into a separate part of society. So uh, this uh, uh, was one of the, uh, the primary and most uh, famous arguments. Earl Warren had a majority of the Supreme Court behind him uh, to make this decision almost immediately after hearing arguments the, the second time. So the, the decision could have been made quickly and announced, but Warren believed that this decision needed to be 9-0, uh, all judges voting unanimously uh, behind, uh, you know, uh, striking down separate but equal uh, and starting the process of desegregating the schools. Um, he wanted it to, you know, look like a slam dunk decision. Like this is a no brainer. Of course, it was nine zero because uh, this is an obvious uh, uh, injustice. So the schools need to be integrated, uh, you know, as soon as possible. But there were uh, a few recalcitrant figures on the court, 
and he spent uh, a number of weeks lobbying them. Uh, you know, privately, the Supreme Court meets in, in kind of private uh, chambers, but he, as a foreign politician, worked on them, apparently, uh, and eventually got them all to come around uh, so that it was a 9-0 decision when it was finally announced uh, and read uh, and the, 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 you know, the official opinion written by Warren himself uh, you know, became official and finalized. Here you see uh, a famous person uh, in the civil rights movement, two of them in fact, uh, Rosa Parks, uh, uh, a very significant figure. Uh, it's her action in, uh, as you probably know, sitting down uh, intentionally in the uh, whites only section of a bus uh, after a, a long day of work as a seamstress in Birmingham, Alabama that uh, kicked off the famous Montgomery bus boycott which is usually seen as the uh, opening uh, uh, shots fired uh, in the civil rights movement. In the background you see a young uh, Martin Luther King and I like this photo in particular for that reason because Martin Luther King is in the background. Uh, why is that uh, uh, significant because it's this event that made him famous or started to make him famous. He had just been uh, uh, a guy uh, uh, who uh, got a, a job as a, uh, a minister uh, at a church in Montgomery uh, not too long before these events and he was already somewhat involved in civil rights activity here uh, but he just happened to get that job there and so was in the right place at the right time uh, or the wrong place at the right time or wrong place at the wrong time depending on how you look at it. Uh, his father had. Uh, his father was a very prominent pastor uh, in the African American community uh, in a church in Atlanta, Georgia. So King grew up uh, among uh, pastors who were you know, brilliant uh, speakers and sermonizers. Uh, so uh, no wonder that he became uh, a gifted speaker, orator, uh, and preacher himself. Uh, he had a, a sort of uh, experience with it uh, from a very very young age. Uh, Dr. King was also extremely well educated, uh, uh, so honing his uh, ability to get uh, his point across eloquently uh, through uh, multiple degrees. But this is kind of the last picture uh, that you really see him, uh, at least the, that sort of gets uh, shown uh, uh, today, uh, where he's in the background. From this point forward, he's going to you know, be the forefront of virtually everything. Uh, but uh, this does indicate that it's right here uh, that he first kind of makes his mark partially uh, because he just happened to be uh, in that city when this event happened, which was kicked off by Rosa Parks' uh, action, which did, of course, uh, uh, take courage. Uh, uh, not that she's the only person uh, that did that in the South, but it uh, uh, did carry risks. She was arrested, and the civil rights community, which included Dr. King, uh, got together and decided uh, uh, that they needed to do something about this, uh, and uh, what they decided was they needed to uh, use the arrest uh, and the, publi uh, uh, the publicizing of it, of Rosa Parks, uh, uh, to uh, make a statement uh, uh, about segregation. Uh, and uh, they, their strategy became a boycott of the bus system in Montgomery to try to force the city, the community, uh, to desegregate uh, that uh, bus system. And they... Uh, basically chose Martin Luther King as their leader. As I said before, it was someone, uh, somewhat unsolicited. Uh, I don't think he'd really sought to be the leader, but many of the older ministers and activists around him saw uh, a, a lot of talent in this guy, which was true, and so they thought he would be the, uh, the perfect leader, and he accepted, and the rest is history, as they say. So uh, King... Uh, did take the lead from here uh, and uh, uh, going forward uh, more so. But as I said, this is the event that put him on the map uh, as far as uh, becoming a national, uh, a nationally known figure. The boycott itself went on for the better part of a year. And African Americans showed solidarity uh, by refusing to ride the buses uh, in Montgomery, oftentimes at great personal sacrifice. Many of them didn't have cars. They'd have to uh, walk to work, uh, sometimes find rides from other people. Uh, there was kind of a ride share uh, a car system uh, amongst those that did have cars. A couple of uh, white people uh, that were sympathetic uh, 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 you know, donated their cars, acted as kind of taxi drivers, uh, so to speak. Not that all African Americans 
uh, avoided the buses, I never get 100% of people to be involved in a boycott. But it was enough to put uh, serious pressure on uh, the city. The idea, of course, was to uh, hit the city in the pocketbook uh, by taking away uh, you know, the fares that it got. The bus system, of course, was open to white people too. That's why there were two sections in the bus. Uh, but since the African-American community tended to be uh, uh, much poorer on average, uh, it was uh, there were way more African-Americans, a much larger percentage, uh, that used the bus, uh, the public bus system, than white people. So with African-Americans overwhelmingly avoiding the buses, uh, this is taking revenue away from the city. And even m more so in that direction, African-Americans, to get to city stores, uh, to go to the, the market, go to uh, you know, hardware stores, department stores, uh, they were owned by whites, uh, primarily, not that, were, not that there were no black-owned businesses, but uh, to get into sort of the downtown area, they usually took the buses. And with the buses, you know, uh, not being used, African-Americans then, in a sense, indirectly, were boycotting uh, white merchants in the community as well. And that may have been one of the deciding factors in uh, this boycott being successful, uh, which it was successful after uh, over a year. Uh, and that is that the white merchants, the white store owners, business owners, it hit them in the pocketbook as well as the city. And they, to some degree, uh, I think, put pressure uh, then on the city uh, to uh, desegregate the buses uh, not that they weren't racists, uh, most of them or all of them uh, certainly were, uh, but that their racism uh, was apparently, at least with this group, uh, uh, less important to them uh, than their profits. Uh, I don't know what that says. Uh, it says they're racists and greedy too, I suppose. Uh, but uh, it did work uh, in the end. So not only was this the first event, uh, or the first uh, you know uh, civil rights uh, uh, activity, uh, starting the movement itself, uh, but it was a successful one. So like I said, the civil rights movement became a model for other movements uh, later on uh, in the 1960s, uh, but its very first uh, civil rights action uh, on a large scale, uh, sort of mass protest, which you see in the pictures here, uh, was a success story. But not easily, as you see in the picture, Martin Luther King got, uh, Martin Luther King got arrested, Rosa Parks got arrested, other uh, leaders uh, of the movement arrested as well. And King and others were arrested multiple times. Uh, there was a, a deliberate strategy on the part of the local authorities uh, to just pull civil rights activists and leaders over uh, for anything and find any excuse to throw them into jail. And this was just to kind of wear them down, uh, to intimidate them, to you know get them to, to give up, uh, which you know, we can see didn't work in the end, uh, but the, the, the effort was uh, uh, you know, uh, done uh, in earnest on the part of uh, not all whites, but uh, uh, the racist part of the community, uh, which did unfortunately include city authorities, uh, you know, the police, um, uh, and so forth. It even got violent. Martin Luther King, uh, this, this is not the only example of it, but uh, a bomb exploded on uh, his front porch uh, uh, one night, uh, and fortunately for him and his family, uh, they were all, you know, inside and further away. I'm not sure if everyone was even home, but some in the family were, I think he was, uh, and nobody was injured. But uh, this uh, sent a message to not just King and his family, but everybody involved, uh, that this uh, could be dangerous business uh, because, uh, you know, uh, at least a segment, probably a large segment of the white community, was not happy with the boycott at all, though. Uh, you know, most of them wouldn't uh, commit acts of violence like this, but there were uh, uh, there was more than one. So uh, this was dangerous uh, 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 activity to be involved in, uh, to be certain. And this would be true throughout the civil rights movement. Civil rights activists and leaders uh, took their lives in their own hands. Uh, they showed uh, had to show great courage to uh, make strides uh, in the direction of civil rights. And uh, we come right to a famous example of it. And I do apologize for the picture, the photo on the right, which is uh, uh, difficult to, to look at. Blame me if you skip right through this uh, and don't. Uh, but I believe that in studying history, uh, we have to uh, deal uh, with the, the ugliest truths of all. Uh, because to really, I think, understand the horrors uh, and the severity uh, of racism 
and segregation and discrimination uh, towards African Americans in the South and in the country at large, uh, I think we have to sometimes see uh, how vicious uh, the racism uh, actually was. Emmett Till uh, was a, a teenager, a young teen uh, from the North who went to visit relatives uh, in the South uh, in uh, 1955. And he wasn't, uh, he wasn't really v very well versed in the customs uh, of the South that were somewhat different uh, where he came from in the North in Chicago. Uh, and so this probably had something to do with, with what came next.